Darby, uh, maybe you could just give us a, an idea of um, your sort of prehistory before you became associated yes, with. Well, I'll, I'll be I'll be very brief. I grew up in Hanover, so I didn't fall that far away from the tree. But uh, I was in Seattle for law school and, and private practice, and I thought I'd. In 1974, I thought I'd try this environmental stuff for a while, then figure out what I was going to do with my career. So we moved back to Vermont. I was hired by VNRC. Uh, it turned out it was a huge financial problem. that We were about five weeks from self-destruct, but we managed to make it through. And, and very early on, within the first two months, I met Rick and got involved with the Heartland Open Space Project. So... But I, th I think one thing I wanted to say about, about Rick is that this was an era in Vermont where you really had an opportunity to make it up as you went along. And, and if you had a good idea and get people behind you, it was really an opportunity that existed at that time to, to pursue those ideas. And as I say, make it up. <laughs> That's true. And it was making things up as we went along. There's no question about that. Uh, <laughs> But it was within a framework that was pretty important to the state at that point in time. I mean, from the late 60s into the 70s, land use planning was becoming a high priority throughout Vermont. Uh, the state uh, established regional planning commissions. Uh, uh, at the time it was done, there were 14 regional commissions. That was when I became director of the regional commission in, in Woodstock, there were 13. Now they're 11. Uh, but it was uh, uh, a focus uh, of the state, very, very important to the state, which also was parallel to the development of Act 250 in the state land use and development, uh, planning and development laws. Um, so we're, they're going side by side, really. But the Atiquiji region was different from the other regions in that it took a natural resource uh, base as uh, the focus for, for regional planning, a watershed concept, a natural resource base based on the Scottish planner Ian McCarg. I don't know if anyone is familiar with his work. He wrote a book in the, in the uh, late 60s, Design with Nature, uh, which looked at uh, uh, developing re regional plans based on the, the natural resources in an area. And the Atacuichi region took that approach. I came in as the, the uh, regional plan was being completed. Uh, the land use plan was uh, done on a regional basis first, and then working with individual towns to implement that plan. Uh, and that's where the Heartland Open Space Project came into play. We're working with the town of Heartland. They did a really good job on their land use planning and went to try to implement it. And then at the time, the typical way of implementing a land use plan was through regulation, zoning and subdivision. Well, the zoning regulations never got passed in the town of Hartman or in other towns, to, as a matter of fact. Uh, so we were looking for alternatives to regulation to be able to implement the land use plan. The town planning commission wanted to look at tax stabilization as an approach. Uh, and that was, a, to me, a, a brand new way of thinking about uh, land use and how to, how to create an incentive program for, for landowners to make decisions about the use of their land that would fit in with a, with a town land use plan. Uh, so the Heartland Open Space Project was started <clears throat> through the town planning commission's effort to deal with tax stabilization and Darby was brought in because he was, uh, he can bring the legal mind to bear on how you put together a program like that. Yeah. Okay, and let, let, me, um, let, let me interrupt you just for a second because we do have Nick Richardson, our president um, here, and I'm not sure if he can stay for the whole thing, but uh, uh, welcome, Nick. Um, Want to say a few words? Yeah, um, thanks so much, Bob. It's really good to be with everybody. Um, I'm in Chester, uh, Jim, not too far from you uh, at all. Um, and it's, um, and I'm not going to be able to stay for the whole thing, but I'm going to stay on as long as I can um, because this is a really, really wonderful topic. It's great to see everybody. Um, I'm looking at Mike Schoenfeld and Clive Gray and a bunch of others. I love Zoom and the way it uh, gives us the opportunity to come together 
And Darby, I think, you know, just I was I was able to hear I've been on for most of the presentation and able to hear your your description of Vermont being a place where you could bring a group of people together and make stuff up and make things happen. And I'll just say I think that spirit is alive and well at VLT. We f still feel like Vermont is that place and we certainly uh, continue to approach opportunities around land and land access and the future of this place with that spirit in mind. So um, it's just really great to be with you all um, and to be hearing this history, um, which for me is also, you know, deeply a family history. Um, my, my grandparents um, were conservationists who worked with both Rick and Darby and Peter Stein and others who were on the call. Um, and so when I think about the history of VLT, um, it's, it's exciting for me because it informs so much about where we're going as an organization today. And it's also a chance for me to really re reconnect with my own roots and uh, the things that drive me to do this work. So glad to be here with you all. Thanks. So Thanks. let me ju j jump in on the Heartland. We, we came up with four different alternatives. Three were based on tax stabilization agreements, which were allowed at that time and a number of towns had used. And one was based on conservation easements in one section of town. And uh, uh, that was a totally new concept at the, at the time in this, in this state. And uh, we went through a, a year of hearings and working through the details with the, with the local planning commission uh, and putting out a little publication and having public hearings and it all came to a vote and it all got gunned down about a two to one basis. <laughs> so a year's worth of work was just in total shambles by the end of that. And uh, Rick was going to say, say, oh, well, now what? Yeah. Well, and what, uh, Rick, Rick I, I understand yeah. that you um, had a colleague there at the Regional Planning Commission who was, I don't know, was he there for about five years, Harvey Jacobs? Harvey Jacobs, uh, he was there about th uh, five years total, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he was, uh, when I became director of the Regional Commission, Harvey was already there. He had been hired a couple of years before I came. And he, he took the lead in the Heartland Open Space Project you know, working with the Town uh, Planning Commission. Uh, so he was pretty important in developing the alternatives that Darby just mentioned. And, and and some, well, I was just going to say, the public meetings that Darby mentioned, there, we held a series of public meetings in that year that the program was being developed with a really good participation, it seemed, from the members of the community coming to those meetings. And then when the vote came about and defeated everything that had been tried, that had been proposed, it was a real big disappointment, I can tell you. And I, <laughs> yeah. I remember sitting with Darby the day after the vote uh, uh, and just commiserating with him on all the work that had been done and the, the positive nature of the public meetings and the negative results oh. of the vote. Uh, so, so, so there were two two things that came out of that. I just want to mention in passing. One was one was the framework for the for the current use program because tax stabilization for uh, or taxation of of working lands was a big issue at that time. And one of the one of the uh, three tax stabilizations proposals sort of tied tax stabilization with productive use of of either farmland or, or managed forest land. And that whole concept was picked up and, and became part of the current use program as it's, as it's now structured. The other piece was, was the land trust. And, and, mm -hmm. and how, how did you get to the land trust idea? I, I know you had a, a conversations about, well, what do we do now? Right, well, that, as a, doing the, uh, the post-mortem on the Heartland Open Space vote, and, and going through what can we do now? We've tried uh, the, the standard approach of regulation, which was even if you could get zoning regulations, they never uh, uh, matched what the, the town plans were really looking for in maintaining the rural character of their communities. For example, two acre zoning doesn't maintain any rural character of anything. Uh, but that's what towns would, would do often. Uh, so that, that wasn't an alternative that we felt was very helpful, really, in the long run. 
we tried looking at transfer development rights programs. I, I don't want to go into the technicalities of that, but you need a, a strong real estate market uh, more more closely associated, associated with suburban type development for transfer of development rights programs to work. Uh, and purchase of development rights program, we looked at that as well. Now, there you need money. Uh, and the money wasn't available. But at any rate, so what What else can we do? And I, I said in our conversation with Harvey, well, why don't we try a land trust? And Harvey said, that sounds like a great idea. What in the hell is a land trust? <laughs> so well, that's, I mean, that's the, the only example... Land trust. <laughs> the only example we had in Vermont at the time was the Nature Conservancy, and they had been active through Hub Vogelman and others uh, in, in acquiring and protecting ecologically important lands. So the land right. trust, after a lot of discussion, just decided to focus on both productive lands, farm and forest land, and what I would call community projects, lands that were important to a community for some reason. Yeah, we and didn't I want think to... in, in, in terms of the productive lands, I think the insight that we had is that all, reg, all Act 250 and local zoning was going to do was slow the process, the loss, down. But if you really wanted to preserve working farms or large tracts of forest land, you weren't going to get there by, by regulation. Even if constitutionally you could require a farm to stay a farm uh, at, at, at you know, fairness is that this is a farmer's retirement fund. You've got to compensate them if they, if they want. So anyway, we, we, we decided to focus in these areas and really be, and be a supplement or an addition to the regulatory framework that had already been established. In, them. Well, one of, in setting up the land trust, we, we followed a, a procedure that I had tried dealing with what you might think is a completely separate uh, problem and that was affordable housing in the region. And at the same time that we're doing the Heartland Open Space Project, I was wrestling with that subject uh, and decided to put together a committee of local people who were interested in it and, and see what we could do. And putting that committee together, we started focusing on where affordable housing could go, uh, what was the priority with affordable housing, uh, we decided elderly uh, people who were most at risk and needed help. We identified property that we could actually purchase and, uh, and develop uh, affordable housing on. Uh, so we, we did that. We actually purchased two historic buildings in the village of Woodstock and developed 11 units of affordable housing. The first affordable housing developed in the Woodstock area after years and years of discussion about the need to do that. And later we added another 15 units of new, new housing behind the uh, historic structures uh, and financed the whole thing through local fundraising to buy the property initially and then refinancing through the Vermont Housing Finance Agency and, and uh, supporting the whole project through uh, Section 8 funding from HUD. Uh, that was an example in my mind that could be used to, to deal with land use in general and land conservation in particular. And so we did exactly the same thing. We put together a citizen group, talked about the options and the alternatives, uh, came up with the approach that Darby just described, focusing on productive farmland and forest land, and formed the, the land trust in 1977. That's how it all came about. Yeah, I want to I want to underscore this link with affordable housing because obviously I'm jumping way ahead. But if you looked at what's the most important accomplishment we made in the first ten years, it was helping establish the the housing conservation trust or board trust fund. And whereas many people would think of land land conservation and affordable housing has been mutually conflicting, one canceling the other or precluding the other. Rick was thinking in terms of what, does make, what makes a community a viable place, and you need both of these things. So when the idea came along, and nobody really knows where it came from, uh, uh, in 1986, 87, 
Uh, it just made a lot of sense at that time. But I'm jumping, I'm jumping way ahead. Yeah, but the affordable housing connection with land conservation is really important because it does yeah. tie in. It, it ties in the whole planning effort that was going on. We're looking not at one thing, but a, a holistic approach to various issues relating to community needs. Uh, economic development was another area that I was interested in and wanted to take the same approach there. But the land trust started uh, taking over our, our because it was it became uh, fairly successful, uh, started taking up all of our time. And so it's hard to devote to other issues as well. Uh, <clears throat> So, so when you got underway, you had your first first meeting in, in 1977, and you had a board of trustees established by then. Were those folks you had interacted with in the affordable housing side of things too, or how did you how did you get, gather them together? There was an overlap, uh, but not everybody was the same. It dealt with both issues, uh, but uh, the original board. Uh, <clears throat> Local local people who were interested, we knew through our planning efforts, were interested in land conservation, uh, and historic preservation was another concern, uh, and, and just kind of sort of, sort of naturally came together to form the board, uh, <clears throat> and at the same time, uh, in 1977, when we when we incorporated, we needed to apply for tax exempt status. And we got assistance from John Dunn, an attorney in Heartland, who was familiar with our work with the Heartland Open Space Project, and was a friend of Harvey Jacobs. And uh, he was off, he offered to help us uh, uh, with our legal issues at the outset, and did our IRS uh, uh, application for us, uh, which was successful fairly quickly. Uh, in a few months, we had our tax exempt status, and at that point, we went public. Uh, let me um, let me take a, a quick second to share some images. Is it, uh, people seeing these on screen? Good. Um, this is really just setting the stage in the '60s and '70s. What was going on in the state? Um, and uh, got some good quotes from George D. Aiken and Theron Boyd, who we'll hear more about probably in the next session. We won't get to it today. Um, but there you can see what Williston looked like before the interstate, during its construction, and after it was underway. Um, but I, I did want to bring up the minutes to the first board meeting of the Ataquichi Regional Land Trust and some of the key characters that have already come up. Um, I, I honestly, when I was uh, delving into the files for, for the materials for today's session, this felt like kind of a, the Declaration of Independence. The paper was like parchment, you know, and I, I was afraid to touch it at first. Um, but it was fun to see these names, some of whom I became familiar with later and some who I, I knew as soon as I arrived um, on the scene myself in 1980. But um, it, was, it was the third meeting that um, there was a discussion about the IRS application and IRS needing additional information. And then Darby Bradley giving a presentation on the status of easements under Vermont law. Um, so that it shows you right away they were jumping into some pretty consequential stuff that had uh, a bearing on on how the organization developed over the years. Um, the first annual meeting um, included all of these characters, of course, and and the the mention of the Vermont Institute of Natural Science and a educational program on the first property that the land trust um, acquired, which was a gift from the Connecticut River Watershed Council. Um, and then um, I couldn't resist putting in the first annual meeting financial report for the Vermont Land Trust. It looks quite different today. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but then just some images of, of uh, Rick, the visionary, and um, Darby in, in two stages of maturity. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and there's Harvey Harvey Jacobs who yep. 
went on to become a, a renowned professor at the University of Wisconsin and the university was overseas for a long time. Um, we've become reconnected. I actually got a, um, he was one of my advisors at the University of Wisconsin, interestingly. And there um, is God. John Dunn, who um, we perhaps will hear more about, uh, but uh, Rick just mentioned him. And he is, of course, the father of Matt Dunn, um, former senator and gubernatorial candidate who still lives in Heartland. And he and his wife were kind enough to send along an image from John. Um, so that, um, that brings us up to maybe, um, maybe it's good to jump right into the first major thing that, that the land trust worked on, which was the Appalachian trail project. Um, and just quickly, Everybody knows where the Appalachian Trail goes. The area that the land trust was focused on was the kind of 50 mile section from Killington to um, the state line. Um, but Rick, maybe you could pick it up and, and talk about how Prest Preston Bristow got involved and how that whole thing evolved. Right. Before we do that, I just want to say, uh, and this is, we got involved in the Appalachian Trail at the end of 1977, in December of 1977. <clears throat> Before that, I just wanted to mention that we had, we had given the IRS all of the information they had requested. We had received notification of our tax exempt status, only to get a letter a couple of months later saying they were going to withdraw our tax exempt status because we referred to protection of productive agricultural land. We had to redo our, our articles of association and, and bylaws to take out reference to agricultural land. Really? Otherwise we would have yeah, lost at, our tax. At that land. time, at that time uh, conservation of agricultural land was not considered a charitable purpose. You had to be organized for exclusively for charitable purpose. So we just substitute open space and, and, uh, that, and sail through. That took care of it. But <laughs> it, it shocked us when we, we had yeah, to yeah, do yeah. that. At any rate, uh, in December of 77, uh, the National Park Service contacted me as director of the Yadakwecha Regional Planning Commission about the National Scenic uh, Trails Act, which had uh, had been passed by Congress and, and money appropriated to protect the Appalachian Trail with a 1,000 foot wide corridor throughout the, the 2,000 some miles of the trail. And as uh, Bob mentioned, 50 miles of that went through the Yadakwecha region. So I uh, put together a public meeting inviting the National Park Service representatives of the Appalachian Trail Project and the Appalachian Trail Conference, a nonprofit organization supporting the trail, uh, to a meeting in Woodstock of landowners and anyone interested in, in the trail. Uh, the, uh, uh, the meeting was, was uh, sold out. I mean, there were people there probably for the meeting. And it was quite a raucous meeting because issues of uh, a private property right well, Rick, we're having we're having trouble, and 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 uh, yeah, I think the the basic message here is that Rick hired Preston Bristow, who had been uh, been the chair of the Green Mountain Club, and had no knew uh, knew about what it took to run a a, a trail, build and and run, and and Preston was a was a key liaison person. He, uh, he gained the trust of the landowners. They were working on where the trail would run. They were trying to get it off of town roads onto sort of a re more remote areas. Uh, and he gained the, the, the trust of both the Parks Service and the landowners and was able to negotiate that. Hanging over everything was the fact that the National Park Service had power of eminent domain and could come in and condemn it. And that would have been a disaster in Vermont, they had this had already blown up with the with the uh, Bristol Cliffs Wilderness area, so Harvey was able to keep, or excuse me, uh, Preston was able to, with Rick's help, keep things 
uh, on an even keel. The other important thing that happened at that period was that the Park Service had their their idea was to acquire in fee simple owner outright ownership uh, to 200 to a thousand foot swath. Some of these the trail ran through or next to farms. It would have just cut everything. It would have been a huge controversy. And we managed with a lot of negotiation to uh, uh, get them to, that may be their preferred approach, but that they would be willing to accept a, a, a right of way, a trail easement right of way uh, and protected on each side, uh, 100 to 500 feet with a, with a conservation easement. And that was a big step. Uh, frankly, because it, it allowed the ownership to stay in the hands of, of the farm owner or the woodland owner. Uh, and, th and they had the option of, 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 of either selling it outright or going this trail easement, conservation easement approach. I was involved with the discussions about the use of conservation easements, not so much the, the, the other part of it. Uh, but it, it was an, an early example of a nonprofit public partnership uh, and, and obviously private partnership as far as the landowner is concerned. And you see this, this, this has been a theme running through 40 years of history of the organization that we, we've worked with local government, state government, federal government on, on mutual goals. And it's been, I think, a really key part of our success. And you, you may have mentioned this, uh, Darby or Rick, um, but the Appalachian Trail Conference was also kind of in the mix. They were, didn't they provide a grant to the trust to, to participate? Or do I have that wrong? I wish, I, I don't, I, I think you're right. I was not on the staff at that point. I don't, I don't know if Rick, yeah. Rick would be able to answer that. Well, what, what I did turn up, and, and this kind of is a, a and end point of, of the formal work that um, the trust did at that time. But I guess after about 10 years, 90% of the Appalachian Trail Corridor in Vermont um, was secured, really, for, for public purposes. The land trust had helped coordinate federal acquisition of 132 tracts of land, um, 50 miles of trail, um, along 50 miles of trail, and encompassing about 5,000 um, acres through two counties and 11 towns. So it was quite a successful in initiative. One thing that became clear early on from, from my reading, and I gather um, you, you were involved in this as well, uh, Darby, is pretty quickly that Ottaquichi Regional Land Trust was like the only game in town. So calls began coming from all, all around. And one of the most consequential visits you had was from uh, Sue and Bob Lloyd. You want to pick up that, that story? Sure. This was actually in the uh, 79 or, or so, 78, 79, when we were just really getting started. And I, I want to leave you with the fact that in the first three years, the land trust conserved a total of six acres of land. So, you know, <laughs> we, we had to kind of pick up the pace. <laughs> and 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 Rick, the board decided to hire Rick as their first executive director. But Bob and Sue Lloyd were a, a, uh, a couple that had, with five other couples, had purchased about 1,200 acres of land in the town of Tinmouth. Tinmouth being well outside the the Ottaquichi watershed, and they came for help because two of the six families wanted to leave the investment. They were all, and they were all school teachers and, uh, and were not wealthy folks and two wanted to get out and they didn't, they didn't have, the other four didn't have the ability to, to buy them out. This was, a, it was an unusually large piece of land, 1200 acres. It had a working farm of about 250 acres. It had a lot of land under management with the New England Forestry Foundation and it had about a 300 acre wilderness area. So it had a lot of different components to it. And what we eventually worked out was the fact that, that they would conserve and sell the farm to the young couple that was, that was leasing it and who wanted to buy it. And that produ produced some, some cash and then they also Put a conservation easement of sort of a wilderness easement on the or for, for a wild easement on the 300 acre uh, wilderness 
small Tinmouth Gulf wilderness area, and then a, a working forest easement on the, uh, the rest of the land, reserving a total of eight development sites that were carefully picked, and each family, each of the remaining families would get two of those. And the combination of the income coming in and the tax deductions from the, the gift of conservation easements was enough to, to satisfy the two exiting couples. Um, so it was, a, it was a huge project for us, it, and it set a whole number of precedents. One is that it required us to think about what, what, are, what are the actual terms of a conservation easement on a working farm, on managed forest land, on a wilderness area. And John Dunn and I sort of worked that out. And that template that was created is really uh, wilderness area aside, the, the other two are very, very similar in structure to what is there now. And the fact that the Vermont Land Trust or Ottaquichi Land Trust had 10 years before the Housing Conservation Board came along and the Upper Valley Land Trust and others came along, we got a chance to work with that template and that was picked up. And so there's a common practice throughout Vermont, which was really important down, down the road. Uh, the other, the other, another important precedent was uh, the board said, well, if, if there's no other local land trust that can, can for the landowners to work with, you, you can work outside the region. And so it was the beginning of the expansion to becoming a, a statewide organization. And then the, the third thing that was the most important, Rick and I had been looking around for some project to get the state into the game. We had already begun to realize that unless the state was involved, we were not going to be able to conserve working lands and force outside of really wealthy communities. They had done a really wonderful project in South Woodstock uh, without a lot of outside support, but that was because it was only a couple farms and a lot of wealthy people could participate. And if you wanted to conserve working lands in other parts of the state that didn't have that kind of wealth, uh, we, we needed the state to be involved. The state had actually been authorized to acquire conservation easements uh, in 1968 and had never used this authority. And they, they required, they had a bunch of criteria. One was it had to, the land had to be under imminent threat of development and it had to be available for public recreational use. And, and that sort of took everything off. But what they were really, what we figured out was that what they were really worried about was the, the, the obligation of looking after these conservation easements down the road, that, that if, uh, if budgets were cut, they would either have to let the easements go or cut something else in their, in their program. So that's, they were really reluctant for good reason to take this on. So the Ottaquichi Land Trust said, well, we can, we can do that part. We can document the land. We can do the stewardship. We can stay in touch with the landowner and, and um, take that burden off, off the state. But on the other hand, the state is behind us because we're here, we're a, you know, a three-year-old organization with, uh, you know, $2,500 in the bank or maybe a little bit more than that and, and uh, not much of a track record. Uh, so it was helpful to us and we were concerned that the courts might not really enforce these things. They say, oh, well, it's an obligation. It's a violation, but it's not a big deal. Let let it go, or pay a fine, or something. Um, so uh, anyway, and the the Tinmouth property, given all the size and all of the components, and our willingness to take on the stewardship burden, really put it, put the issue to the state is, is either going to participate in this game or we're, or we're not. Um, uh, and they and after much discussion uh, with the commissioner of Forest and Parks and the governor, uh, they accepted it. And this was in 1981, yeah. and really was the beginning of the state involvement uh, in conservation easements and conservation conservation of privately owned lands. And I think, as you pointed out in uh, something you wrote, it increased uh, the portfolio. Uh, by approximately 20,000% held by the Vermont Land Trust to, to be Vermont Land Trust. <laughs> yeah, yes. it was, yes. <laughs> six, six acres to 1,206 acres. <laughs> well, there were a few other projects in the, in the interim, but you can see from, you can see from that map, the Lloyd, uh, 
uh, Thompson, Macintosh. Uh, there were a number of, of of other properties in that in that valley, but that you know that idea started leading to uh, others getting it, and so there's a lot more conservation that has happened there uh, since since that, those early days, and and a good chunk of an amazing chunk of Tinmouth is is now. Uh, protected in one way or the other. What was the Tinmouth Channel uh, wildlife management area? Was that in existence, or did that end up coming about in part due to the effort that was going? That on? was really the effort of the Nature Conservancy. This this is a very yeah. important uh, wetland area, mm-hmm. and I I don't remember the exact dates of it, but it was uh, the TNC worked on that. Let's move into the. Um, Country Day School, or Country School, Woodstock Country School. I, I hope that's a correct image. Do you recognize that image, uh, Darby? Uh, there were a number of buildings uh, on, on this. Uh, and I, you know, I was only tangential. I wasn't really involved in this at all. I remember sort of reading about it and saying, what are those, what are those guys up to? This is John <laughs> Dunn and Rick, and, and, a, and, a, and a very... Uh, active, involved group locally. This the school. It's about 320 acres. It lots of buildings on the property, uh, and it was it was in it was approaching bankruptcy. And the board uh, gave the Atacuichi Land Trust a 30-day right of first refusal. Uh, and a, about within within a month of of our getting that. Uh, a, a developer from Boston came along and offered um, what turned out to be about a million dollars. And so we had 30 days to match a million dollars. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and we really had, or the organization had very little money in it. And, and uh, two, two things happened. That, uh, the, the John Dunn dreamed up this idea of charitable creditors, which I won't go into, it's, it's long involved, but basically, they, they, people were saying, if you if if the land trust buys the property and works out a, a plan and then you know we'll the this. property and we lose money, we'll we'll okay. we'll make contribution in proportion to the our percentage of the whole pool to cover that loss. So if 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 you pledged a thousand dollars and and the, there's a hundred thousand dollars in a pool, you're you're taking on one percent of the risk. And if it's two hundred thousand dollars in the pool, it's two percent of the risk. And fortunately, a very wealthy person, Jack uh, Byrne, Dorothy Byrne, who lived across the road, agreed to take this on. And uh, f- first of all, that to buy the main buildings uh, for half a million dollars, so that sort of reduced our, our risk. And then when the, went through the whole planning process, they agreed to buy the balance of the property uh, outright with no restrictions on it, but. Uh, two days later, uh, donate the donate the conservation easement back, and what and and uh, uh, there are a lot of other people involved in it who people who contributed money to pay cover expenses. This was in an era of of bank interest rates being at at sixteen to eighteen percent. It was early nineteen nineteen eighty, um, and and it all it all came out that that. Uh, uh, we covered all of the costs. We never had to go back to the charitable creditors and ask them for a contribution. And so everyone thought, "Wow, this is a this is a miracle." Here we are. We've we've managed to, to fend off a a developer, protect the land. I mean, there were there were houses there. There was some opportunity for for uh, additional limited development in very selected areas. And today it's because our Green Mountain Horse Association property and a working dairy farm uh, uh, is there. So it's, it was just seemed a, a total miracle. And I sitting up in Montpelier, I just thought, oh, what are these guys up to? <laughs> Take, exercising a right of first refusal for a million dollars. I mean, it just seemed ridiculous. But they did it. <laughs> can, I, can you hear me now? Yes. Good, Rick. Take yeah. over. Yes. Well, glad glad to have you back, and maybe um, uh, you can reflect a little bit on the uh, country school project. Um, and did did the limited development practice play out in the future in other projects, or was that idea kind of a, a limited term? 
uh, solution to a, a particular problem? It, it, it was, it, I think, very limited in, in terms of uh, the way most of our projects have gone since. There have been others where limited development could, tip, could play a part. But uh, the thought that it would be uh, more of a frequent occurrence didn't, didn't happen. Um, in this case, uh, there were existing properties, buildings that could be used for, for uh, other purposes that could be sold for housing. Uh, and there were some lots that were set aside as the, the, uh, the uh, map shows. Uh, fortunately, most of those lots that actually Jack Byrne donated restrictions on those lots afterwards. So very few of them have actually been developed. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, the, uh, the project, by the way, uh, Darby was talking about the miracle of the project. Our budget for the first year of operation in 1980 was $30,000. I don't know if you mentioned that, Darby. Our actual expenses and income for the year turned out to be almost a million one hundred thousand. And we we exercised this, the right this of typical first, of the era. <laughs> we exercised the right of first refusal on the on the country school, where the the purchase price was one million sixty thousand dollars. We had three thousand dollars in the bank at the time. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty much of a miracle that it, the whole thing was pulled off. We're we're beginning to beginning to run out of time, but Rick and I would I would just say that the I think one of the real besides protecting the the southern gateway into South Woodstock, uh, what happened was was that amongst the people who had participated as charitable creditors, a number of them began to, or, or, or contributors, a number of them began to think in terms of their conserving their own property. And this right. led to a, a really important uh, donation of a, of a remainder interest, a donation of land subject to a, a, uh, a life estate of a, of a beautiful farm in Redding, about five miles south of this. And that was absolutely key to the survival of the land trust in the early 90s when we were under real financial yeah. uh, tests. And the other thing was the publicity about this was uh, really spread throughout the, throughout the state. And it was, I think, as a direct result of this that the webs contacted us you, Rick, about uh, about Shelburne Farms and... Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, it was just a few couple of months after we closed on this pro on the country school project that Alec uh, Webb uh, contacted me and we met to talk about Shelburne Farms and set up uh, a process of trying to work with them, with Shelburne Farms to conserve the farm. So it was a direct outcome of the country school project. That's true. And a lot of other projects that came along at the same time, individuals who were contacting us about their own land. Um, and, oh, there's a nice article. I hadn't seen that one in, in quite a while. Yeah, this was actually from 1986, but it was after yeah, the article. Well, it, it, took, it took us quite a while to work through Shelburne Farms, and we could go through the details if you'd like. But, uh, the initial uh, steps were to identify uh, land on the farm that could be sold to raise money to pay off debt on the farm. Um, and you can see on the, on the map that's shown in the article, uh, Shelburne, uh, uh, the Orchard Point area, um, there were 600 acres of land that was sold to uh, a, a consortium of five people who wanted uh, to develop single family lots, five of them, and then conserve the rest of the land. And that paid off uh, 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 the, the debts that Derek Webb uh, was carrying for the farm. And then we could go from there and working out a land use plan for the rest of the property to raise money to, uh, to uh, uh, keep uh, Shelburne Farms resources going, keep the farm going allow for some limited development. This is where limited development did come into play and it worked uh, and saved the bulk of the farm. That is a map of um, the, 
the whole area as right. it is today in terms yeah. of the conservation that's been done. The Pheasant Hill that's referred to there, that was the group that bought the, the uh, 600 acres to start the project, and then Shelburne Farms, uh, and the land that's been concerned, the white areas, showing areas that could be uh, potentially developed or help in private hands. And then Shelburne Farms uh, Southern, that, that was that came into play later on after 1986 yeah. actually yeah and we are we are close to out of time it's hard to believe but we we um we'd love to have a chance for people to ask questions and it might be a good time to to break for for those um anybody have questions they want to ask of darby or rick the, the first um conservation easements in that that were used in Vermont, would would they have been ones that uh, Ottaquichi Regional Land Trust held, or were there others before? The the Nature Conservancy had uh, negotiated a, a easement on a big property in Addison County, uh, uh, and and interestingly enough, I mean, with with the early or the early documents, uh, there were lots of problems with them and uh, we TNC was lucky to be able to renegotiate that many many years later and upgrade and uh, that easement we had a similar set of of, of luck uh, one of the things that you had to do in order for an easement to run with the land and be enforceable it had to be tied in under Vermont law as it existed in 1977 it had to be tied to a specific piece so we, what we called an anchor parcel. So if somebody was conserve 100 acres, they would give to us two acres out in the back corner that could never develop. And the easement on the 98 acres ran to the benefit of the two acres. And that allowed it to run with the land and could be enforced down the road. We eventually, we tried, we were trying to get that changed in law in the early 80s and, and the senators didn't know what the hell they were talking about bob you would appreciate this bob hartwell uh, uh and you know it looked like it might go the other way so he withdrew the bill but we finally we finally got it put into act 200 in 1988 and i think there were probably three legislators in the building that understood what this was all about, but it got rid of the anchor parcels. And what that allowed us to do was go back to those owners and say, yeah, right here. Uh, go back, back and renegotiate, uh, deed that two acres back. And at the same time, as if the landowner was willing, upgrade the easement so that it, it followed. So some of those early easements, which were not the best drafted in the world because we had so little ex experience we were able to come back uh, a decade later and, and, and renegotiate them and most landowners are willing to do it because we weren't changing the intent we were just trying to clarify it and answer questions that had come up in the interim. Great well we've got a couple of questions one from Mike Schoenfeld uh, why don't we start with Mike your question and, um, and then um, Bob Hartwell. Thanks. Just a, a quick one, Darby and Rick. Fantastic, a fantastic um, evolution is uh, quite extraordinary. And, you know, cheers on that. That's quite remarkable. And Darby, I was curious, of course, having been a fundraiser is, um, and thinking about land conservation across the country, how it seems that the role of philanthropy in Vermont's this guy. has been extraordinary. Uh, is it different, that much different than a lot of the other land trusts around the country? Uh, oh, I, you know, there's extraordinary philanthropy throughout the country, and there are extraordinary organizations. Uh, in, 19, in 2004, I took a sabbatical trip for 10 weeks around the country and visited with 30-plus land trusts and just came away sort of in awe with what they were uh, doing. But I also came away with the feeling that that uh, if you wanted to be in the land conservation business, Vermont was absolutely the best place in the country to be because it had so many of the elements that you needed, the, 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 the private support from private landowners, support from public officials, a relatively slow rate of development. In some places, we're just getting overwhelmed with it. Uh, some some foundations that that had landed on us like the freeman foundation and the john Merck fund uh the housing conservation board funding i mean and and 
support from our senators and congressional delegation. It just, it, everything that you needed to succeed seemed to exist in Vermont and, uh, and, and others, others were, were e equally extraordinary, equally far thinking, but were facing much more difficult tasks in accomplishing. Yeah, I would agree. I think in Vermont, one of the things that, that we were able to uh, at least initially demonstrate was the way to leverage funding uh, from local communities to foundations to the state uh, and involving uh, uh, public and private funds and projects in a fairly substantial way. That, that particularly came to play after the the establishment of the Vermont Housing Conservation Trust Fund, but it was true before then with uh, local funds being brought, in, brought to bear in many projects as well. And uh, other states have not been as, uh, as successful in raising, raising statewide funds to match with, with local funds, although some have. I have, the, I have the distinct honor of having been a co-founder of another statewide land trust the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust. And in Hawaii, they did pass uh, uh, legislation. Uh, it was modeled somewhat after the Vermont Housing Conservation Fund Land Legacy Program. Uh, and that has, has helped out there. But their land values are so high, they need to leverage everything they possibly can to pull off projects. Um, but uh, I think Vermont has a great is a great example. I'm, I'm surprised that other states haven't followed uh, the model that, uh, uh, that we established through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Trust. Let me say one more word about landowners. I mean, for, for, for a lot of landowners, not all, of course, but a lot of landowners, you know, land is a, a part of who they are. It's not a commodity. It's something that right. represents a value that they have and that they want to they want to pass on and i think it's it's easy to forget i don't know what 2500 i don't know what the number of parcels that have now been conserved by the vermont land trust is. It's, it's between 2000 2500 we forget that the, the, this is it's an extraordinary decision on the part of any landowner to take in an outside organization that you don't know who's going to run it down the road and, and whether they're going to look you know keep their word and look after it uh, it's just it's just a, such a vote of confidence and, and support for the for their community in the future and it's a it's a, a, a statement of trust and I think probably if, if, if the land trust has done anything it's it's been able to build a sense of, of trust and confidence with the land owning community so well thank you all um, it, are there any other questions we're, we're Bob, just Bob Hartwell had one I don't uh, think so much a question as it is uh, an observation because uh, Rick is talking about what's going on in the other states. And uh, we've been down in the Sun Belt for about three and a half years. And there's a not nearly as far along as you might expect in the land conservation, of it, uh, the private side of it. And I'm thinking that we have very big and very powerful county governments here that are virtually non-existent by comparison up north. Uh, we have uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, we have 76 parks that are owned by the city. I'm on the Recreation and Parks Commission. The county has many more. We have swimming pools and tennis courts and we have we own two golf courses we bought a golf course that's defunct put a conservation easement on that golf course which made it cheaper for the city and now we're going to have miles of greenway and a, we've got a pool club and all this stuff goes on all over the state uh, a state that runs up until COVID 19 really huge budget surpluses and then they look around for places to spend money building visitor centers in the state parks. They're beautiful and they're huge areas. And I think that may be discouraging addressing, uh, for example, fa uh, farm conservation and productive farm and, and farm succession. And there's and, and the massive wilderness area that's still, there's just enormous areas despite the spectacular population growth. So 
I don't know where that where that leads, but um, we don't have we probably don't have as much land conserved as the Vermont Land Trust does. Right. I I I want this is Wendy over here. You can get in the picture. Yeah. Okay. Um, (laughs) But the land conservation here they're broken down into probably a half a dozen to ten different land trusts. There's no one state land trust. Um, and yeah. I, I wonder if there's any way um, or suggestions, and maybe this is for another conversation, on how to consolidate if there is such a thing. Can we do that? And, and to encourage people to have a common goal statewide. Would those smaller land trusts be willing to get together to talk about creating a statewide entity? I, you know, I think they might. I think they might. Um, I have not gotten involved with them. I've just done some research um, and to discover that they're they're broken down in uh, discrete. That's that's what happened in Hawaii. Uh, Each individual island in Hawaii had a local land trust, and they were having difficulty uh, getting the the knowledge that they needed to, to take on projects raising money to do the projects, yeah. legal help, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> There's one one of the uh, land trusts, the Maui uh, Conservation Land Trust, was doing more than the others. And so we got all of the islands together, all of the local groups together, and started talking about a combined effort. Huh. And, and ultimately, that led to the establishment of the Hawaiian Islands Land Trust with an office on each of the islands. So yeah. they had their local... <laughs> input just as they wanted but they have a statewide presence to work on on uh, all of the issues that are raised funds for everything okay all right that's interesting that's something we need to start to look into here. somebody has to yes. take the lead and bring that together to start that yeah. discussion Cl- clive uh, gray i think you have a question uh thank you um i un- understand uh, darby that at one point the uh, Vermont Land Trust regarded uh, town land trusts, uh, like the Greensboro Land Trust, as competitive with, with VLT. But of course, now uh, we work very closely together. We, we raise funds for uh, most of the VLT projects in our town. Uh, did, did that uh, attitude change as you saw that we could work together? I, uh, Clive, I... But... I don't think I had that attitude, actually. Uh, I, I, my, feeling, my feeling was that, that successful land conservation requires uh, an effort at all levels. I mean, the Champion Lands, which was the absolutely the biggest project that we ever undertook, could not have happened without the Conservation Fund as a national organization at doing. There are wonderful examples of, of local land trusts right, um, that, uh, that have been very successful and long lived. My, my uh, uh, South Hero Land Trust, I, I think, is kind of an interesting model because they don't, they've been extremely active. They know what's important to the community, they know where the resources can be found, have ideas about how it should be done, but they don't want to take on the long term stewardship obligation. So they don't, they, they pass on the easements held by the Vermont Land Trust or the Lake Champlain Land Trust or Nature Conservancy or something. My concern about local land trusts uh, is 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 this issue of of looking after these lands down the road. I think stewardship is in re- in many respects the Achilles heel here. It's very easy to set up a land trust to, to get formed and and but it's it's looking after it down the road and when you know it, Conservation easements are, are nothing but trouble, really, <laughs> and uh, if you have to enforce them, there's no there's no new glory in in enforcing the conservation easement. People and and in a lot of we spend the Vermont Land Trust spends a lot of time cultivating and building relationships with landowners so that we never get violations and rarely go into court and that sort of thing. Uh, and that's a lot of effort, and it's hard. Uh, I think it's hard to sustain. And Clive, you've been part of it, but I think we each all we all have to come back in a hundred years and say, say, how are we doing? Uh, and <laughs> so that was my concern. It wasn't that it wasn't competitive at all. I I think 
I think that uh, my it's, my attitude is that 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 credit is not a limited commodity. If you give half credit to your local partner, it doesn't mean you get half credit. You get full credit. Everybody gets full credit. And in fact, you get extra credit for working together. So that was sort of more my attitude, but I, I, you may have seen it differently, so. Thank you. Rick, your, your uh, observations, I think on the, the first, I think it was the first time that we deeply engaged with another community on something it was perhaps the, outside of an individual project was the Vernon farmland conservation. It seemed like at that time, in the early 80s, there was a desire really to find partnerships with communities um, beyond Vernon. And yeah. so I think we, didn't we kind of imagine that that was gonna be the way it worked? We would have smaller regional groups that would be doing conservation? Yeah, well, I thought when we set up the Ottaquichi Regional Land Trust, that, that there would be regional land trusts set up throughout the state that, that would follow what we did. And there was some interest expressed in Bennington County, and I went down there a couple of times to meet with people about a Bennington Regional Land Trust, uh, but nothing ever evolved from that. <clears throat> um, and we kept doing our projects and getting more and more uh, notice uh, so that it, it became difficult to say what our priorities should be if we didn't have some kind of local input. Uh, to decide what's important, what's really, where should we focus our energies? Um, so from that, we're working with the Mad River Valley Planning District. That was an example of being able to uh, take advantage of that local input. Uh, the Meadowy Valley Project is another uh, effort combining Dorset, Rupert, and Paul, uh, and, and and having them identify the priorities that were important to those three towns. But then small groups started to, to form uh, land trusts. The first one was in Shrewsbury, uh, and then others began to form. I can't recall, I guess Greensboro started after the Craftsbury Farm project, uh, but the smaller land trusts were forming based on the fact that we had been successful and, and, and they wanted to take on that kind of role locally. And that was great in terms of working with local groups. They could, they could identify the priorities a lot easier than we could as a statewide organization mm -hmm. and, and focus our energies in helping them accomplish what they wanted to do. I might mention that uh, in, in the Hardwick area, we now have what's called the Northern Rivers Land Trust, and uh, that has trustees from six towns, and we've conserved land in uh, probably seven towns, and uh, we're hoping to acquire additional towns in, in our region. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that. <clears throat> the one... The one area that does concern me in all of this is is the, in the area of funding. Uh, we're a small state with limited funds. If we start competing with with each other without working together, that can become a real problem. Uh, it hasn't so far, I don't think, but it could. We need to really focus in on trying to cooperate and work together yeah. and not divide up our efforts. I agree. Other other questions? Well, maybe we are wrapping up. Um, I, I will say, of course, that we've got another session coming up in, a, in exactly a month. Um, there's lots to talk about, but uh, I think we're going to try to focus on, again, a, a select group of projects and per, perhaps just kind of a little bit more about the evolution and regionalization of the organization. There's a lot of staff members who be, began to be added to the organization and um, the organization had regional offices established and some very, very interesting and, and uh, consequential projects. So we'll carry on with, with some of those next time. Thank you all for joining us.